Hello everyone, this is Aries Trivia, and welcome back to the Battle of Eating Let's Talk Lore series, as we look to conclude this series with episode 5, titled Liu Bei's Death. Now previously, we covered Liu Bei's costly defeat at the Battle of Yiling, as Lu Xun's carefully laid defensive plan and fire counterattack decimated the majority of the 40,000 Shu Han forces on the south bank of the Yangtze River. Meanwhile, the 10,000 force led by Huang Quan covering the north bank was also cut off by a separate Wu force led by Zhuge Jin and Luo Tong, as Huang Quan eventually decided to march farther north and surrender his forces to Wei rather than to Wu. So with the majority of his veteran troops killed in action and many of his generals lost such as Zhang Nan, Feng Xi, and Fu Rong, Liu Bei now finds himself once again at a low point in his life. But unlike his previous low points, such as when he lost the Xu province to Lü Bu, or when he lost the Xu province again to Cao Cao, or even when his army got crushed at Changban during their escape out of the Jin province, this time felt different, as Liu Bei was now 62 years old. And not only was he older, he was lonelier too, as many of those who had been by his side along the way are all now dead before him. Of his five tiger generals, only Zhao Yun remains as Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were killed before the Yiling campaign, while Huang Zhong had passed away from old age in 220, while Ma Chao also passed away from illness just earlier this year in 222 at only the age of 47. Of his key strategists, only Zhuge Liang remained, as Pang Tong had died in the battle during the initial conquest of the Yi province, while Fa Zheng had passed away to illness not too long after the Han Zhong campaign in 220, at only 44 years old. So, as Liu Bei rested and recovered in Yong'an, or Baidi as it's better known, it became apparent that the task of fully restoring the Han could not be achieved in his own lifetime. And with the Wu forces still posturing aggressively nearby, the campaign was not over yet. Thankfully, there were some signs of hope. Receiving the news of the ill fate of the Battle of Yiling, Zhao Yun had rushed over to Baidi from Jiangzhou with his 10,000 reserve forces. And with the scattered army beginning to regroup, 10,000 more troops who went missing in action during the hasty retreat eventually managed to also make their way back to Baidi. But this number does suggest that the remaining 30,000 troops that were on the south bank were either killed, captured, or had surrendered. Yet with 20,000 troops now garrisoned at Baidi, which is geographically a small peninsula jutting over the Yangtze River at the turn towards the Yi province heartland, Wu's opportunity to press their victory and continue the attack into the Yi province becomes much more difficult so Lu Xun hesitated as his officers bickered with Pan Zhang and Xu Sheng, expressing their desire to press the attack, while Luo Tong countered by pointing out that the Wei forces are starting to show signs of imminent attack on Wu. In the end, when Sun Quan asked Lu Xun for the final call, Lu Xun sided with Luo Tong as he too agreed that given the situation, Wei is the bigger threat. Now previously, we stated that prior to the betrayal of Guan Yu, Sun Quan had already submitted himself to Cao Cao. Then when Liu Bei launched the Yiling campaign, Sun Quan doubled down by voluntarily becoming a vassal of the newly created dynasty of Wei and its emperor Cao Pi. And throughout the campaign, Sun Quan had been submitting progress reports to Cao Pi as any vassal would. And as a matter of fact, when news of Liu Bei's moving the encampment farther inland reached Cao Pi's desk, Cao Pi, who had grown up in the military, astutely pointed out that such an overstretched position was a fatal mistake by Liu Bei. And sure enough, just seven days later, news of Lu Xun's successful counterattack arrived just as Cao Pi had predicted. But despite this cozy relationship on the surface, both sides knew that the vassalage was not genuine. For one, ever since Sun Quan bent the knee, Cao Pi had asked him to send his oldest son, Sun Deng, to serve in the capital, since having a key family member serve as a political hostage was a customary sign of loyalty. 
Yet for almost a year now, Sun Quan has done nothing but to deflect and delay, as it was becoming abundantly clear that Sun Quan's vassalage was only out of necessity given Liu Bei's attack. Thus, with both sides aware of this falsehood, Cao Pi officially declared Sun Quan a traitor in October of 222, as one of the most coordinated campaigns on Sun Quan took place, with a three-pronged attack with the western push into the Jin province, led by Cao Zhen and Cao Xiu, a central push by Cao Pi himself, and an eastern push into Ruxu by Cao Ren. And given the scope of this massive assault across the entire border of the Wu holdings, the initial phase went massively in Wei's favor. In the Jin province, Jiangling was put under siege immediately. Reinforcements sent to the city under General Sun Sheng not only failed to break the siege, but also ended up taking heavy losses to Cao Zhen's forces. Then Zhuge Jin made a second attempt to break the siege, this time using the navy to reinforce the city. But Cao Zhen had prepared small ships loaded with oil as they ended up giving the Wu navy a taste of tribute, once again leading to massive Wu losses. Then on the eastern front, Zhang Nao finally had a chance to launch an offensive attack out of Hefei as Lu Fan's naval forces tried to seal them off with a naval blockade. Unfortunately, the winds were not in Wu's favor this time as strong gusts drifted much of Wu's navy towards the north bank, as a few ships even crashed ashore into the waiting arms of Zhang Nao and Wang Ling's army. Trying to save his men and ship, Lu Fan ordered his navy to dock and fight. But given the weather conditions, the ships ended up crashing into one another near the shorelines, and with Zhang Nao's forces much more dominant on land, Lu Fan was forced to call off the rescue attempt, as in the end, thousands of troops were killed by Zhang Nao, with a few thousand more, drowning as Mother Nature sunk many of the ships that had came in initially in the rescue attempt. Fortunately for Sun Quan, a plague soon halted the way advance, as well as a mishap by Cao Ren, gave them some breather. But with the Wei army still on his borders, Sun Quan resumed tribute to Cao Pi in hopes of peace. At the same time, Liu Bei, hearing the news of Cao Pi's attack, ended up writing a letter to Lu Xun, where he asked, With the enemy besieging Jiangling, I'm planning another campaign east. Will you be ready then? Of course, there is double meaning behind this question, as it can imply either Liu Bei's willingness to work together with Wu again, to beat back Wei, or it could mean that Liu Bei has the desire to backstab Wu at the most inopportune time, much like what happened to Guan Yu. Unafraid of Liu Bei's threats, Lu Xun wrote back, I worry that you haven't had enough time to lick your wounds for another campaign. Regardless of your intentions, perhaps it's best to communicate them with my lord Sun Quan first, or else, if your army comes again, then I promise this time, no one will escape with their life. Yet despite the strength projected by Lu Xun from his reply, Wu was in no shape to deal with Liu Bei, with Wei pressing across all their borders. So by late October, Sun Quan officially sent an envoy to Baidi, seeking peace and a renewed alliance, to which Liu Bei agreed. But despite restoring the alliance with Wu, Liu Bei would never leave Baidi to return to Chengdu, as he would stay to observe the war between Cao Pi and Sun Quan, which would also end soon in a peace settlement. And by March of next year, in 223, Liu Bei would fall ill, and knowing his time is up, Liu Bei would go on to appoint Zhuge Liang and Li Yan as the two regents for his son Liu Shan. And in a much praised move by later historians, Liu Bei, who had summoned Zhuge Liang from Chengdu, told him that he believed Zhuge Liang to be 10 times the talent of Cao Pi. And with the fate of the Han restoration now in his hands, if Liu Shan proves capable, then please aid him. But if he disappoints, then you have my blessing to take the throne for yourself. At the same time, Liu Bei would also leave Liu Shan one of the more famous parenting lines in Chinese history, in Wu Yi E Xiao Er Wei Zhi, Wu Yi Shan Xiao Er Bu Wei, which would translate to no sin is too small to commit and no deed is too small to forego. And with that on April 24th to 23, Liu Bei would pass away in Yuan Palace in Baidi at the age of 63. And with Liu Bei's death, our eating campaign lore series will also come to an end. Next week, we'll be jumping back to Cao Pi 
in a new series to closely examine his seven-year reign of Wei. And as always, hopefully you all enjoyed this series enough to hit the like button to help support the channel, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!